Uh, okay, a warm welcome to all uh, the India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge participants and teams to the sixth, uh, sorry, the tenth webinar of the webinar series, which is focused on scaffolds for the manufacture of cultivated meat. I'm Akshay Bhatt, uh, cultivated meat specialist in uh, science and technology specialist uh, with GFI India, and we'll be hosting this session today along with uh, Nicole Trope, our innovation specialist, uh, who will be the co-host for support. So before we delve into the webinar, as usual rules of engagement, you as a participant can use the Q&A button for questions. And if you have something specific to bring to the notice of all the participants, as well as the panelists, please use the chat section. And please do not use it for any personal communications. But also after the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session for 20, 30 minutes. You can chime in to ask your questions directly live to the panelists where you can uh, just press the raise hand button and we will unmute you for you to ask a question. So uh, quickly moving on to our webinar today, uh, we have two expert speakers, uh, Shubhanka Takle, who is a co-founder and CEO of MayaWorks, and Tom Benayo, senior scientist, GFI Israel. So Shubhanka uh, is an entrepreneur and is one of the very early adapters for cultivated meat sector in India. <clears throat> the startup MayaWorks has been developing novel scaffolding technologies for developing Full cut uh, cultivated meat products and has <clears throat> secured the BIRAC, that is the Biotechnology Industry Research Associate Council big grant of uh, INR 50 lakhs. And is also, or MyOvics, MyOvics has also made it into the semi finals of X Prize. Uh, they are one of the 28 semi finalists uh, startups at X Prize, and MyOvics is now looking to create proprietary chicken cell lines, culture, media, fat formulations, and also looking to collaborate on bioreactor development. By partnering with uh, partnering with key players uh, in this vertical across the world. Uh, <clears throat> so next we also have Tom Benayer. Uh, he's a senior scientist at JFI Israel and one of our teammates. He has volunteered for seven years to promote plant-based nutrition and alternative protein research and development. He specifically joined uh, the academia in order to advance cultivated meat and did his PhD in stem cell and tissue engineering lab at the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Technion Israel Institute of Technology, Haifa where he initiated cultivated meat projects, which uh, cultivated meat project, which translated into a company called Aleph Farms. The work he will present today uh, will be mostly on the science uh, of uh, scaffolding, whereas Subhanka will be focusing a little more into the business uh, area of, uh, or what could be the, some of the business applications of cultivated, sorry, scaffolds uh, in cultivated meat. So Tom, uh, has been a backbone and has been an inspiration for the entire GFI team. He's been de de delivering post work for several universities, such as Tel Aviv, Ben Gurion, Wageningen University, uh, and has motivated hundreds of students and continues to motivate them to scientifically, scientifically align to this emerging sector. So, a warm welcome to both of you, Shivankar and Tom. Thank you. So, uh, again, just to uh, note for everyone that this Smart Protein Innovation Challenge would not have been a uh, reality without the support of our sponsors, our title sponsor, Capital Global, our key sponsors, Nice and Alcon Foundation, organizing partner, CII Co, supporting partners, Byrac, Nifton, Camp, AIC, CCNB, IT Madras by Incubator, Sign and Able, our ecosystem enabling partners, Blue Horizon, BSG, Fixie, Brink, Uncle Capital, Axelor Labs, Provich, Omnivore, Agni, I'm Ventures, Big Idea Ventures, and Hardly. So, yeah, I think uh, just to give you a highlight of what scaffolding is all about, and probably both of them will go much more deeper than this, but it's a critical step in many existing uh, bio processes. It's a seeding of cells uh, on a 3D scaffold. The scaffold often plays a very important role to ensure the efficient transport of oxygen nutrients and waste products to and from cells, controlling the growth of, of the tissue's geometry and free animal structures. The scientists have been able to create animal muscle fat and tissues, but still getting structure to these elements is a main bottleneck to aid muscle and supporting cells to grow into muscle fibers and form muscles, which can be then translated into products such as uh, chops, strips, and steak. So in many uh, ways, I think it's very critical to get those uh, whole cut meats, which has organ organoelectric traits, porosity, and cell compatibility, as well as the regulatory compliance uh, also. So uh, scaffolds have been, have also had, sorry, scaffolds may also have substantial impact on scalability and cost competitiveness of CM, that is cultivated meat by allowing the transition of anchorage growth, uh, dependent growth cells to microcarrier based suspension cultures. So uh, 
Um, I mean, this is just a highlight of why scaffolds and why it's so critical for the sector, especially cultivated meat. But uh, now I would like to invite uh, Shubhankar to take us over this presentation on uh, scaffolding. So Shubhankar, over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks, Akshay. Yeah, uh, so continue. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, Shubhankar. Okay, great. Uh, so everyone, welcome uh, to I, I, the inspirational seminar. I'm glad that you know there is there are people talking about cultivated meat in India. We're so excited uh, for how this can shape the future of protein and meat in India in general. Um, just a quick background: we're MyOx Private Limited. Uh, Nihal and I are co-founders. Uh, I mostly take care of like the science and technology development part of it, and so. Um, I'm excited to tell you guys a, a little bit about what we're doing at MyoWorks and why we think it's consequential to the cultivated meat industry at large. Uh, just as a quick side note, uh, what you see in the background there is a scanning electron microscopy image of our scaffolding material. Um, basically, what that indicates is that it has a lot of porosity that cells can seep through and uh, migrate in three dimension in the scaffold. But let's, let's start with a very, very fundamental question, right? Why scaffolds? Why do we care about this thing? Uh, why is it important? Um, if, if, like, wh why is this seminar important today, right? Um, so simply put, when we talk about muscle or when we talk about a bunch of these uh, food relevant cell types in, uh, in cultivated meat, majority of them grow, especially muscle. Muscle grows as a monolayer. It grows as an adherent monolayer. Uh, when you plate them in a cell culture plate or a T25 flask, etc., when you pull, pull the cells out of an animal or whether it's a cell line that you're working with, uh, if you seed the cells on a, on a plate, they're going to just stick to the bottom and create some kind of a monolayer. And uh, it, it has the consistency of about like some kind of a slimy, wet, um, I don't know, for the lack of a better kind of thing, something like a peel, uh, like a very, very delicate, very, very loosely bound peel, um, which is clearly not meat, right? Like, I think if we do a gut check, all of us among us, if, if you ask yourself, what is meat? What, what has been meat in our lives or, or if we've eaten it, um, meat is usually a very structured three-dimensional product. It is certainly not slime that is growing at the bottom of a petri plate. Um, and that's why scaffolds are important. So kind of two most important things that uh, why, why scaffolds are important is starting with the shape of meat, right? Like I touched on this on this slide that you can't have monolayers and ex expect them to be, you know, expect people to entertain you as if they're meat. No, that's just a monolayer of cells. Uh, if you want meat, you need to get the shape of meat. Um, and so scaffolds can provide that. Scaffolds can provide a porous macroscopic structure that cells can invade, proliferate, um, allow for growth in all three dimensions and create these products that look like meat. And that's a very big first step towards getting people to accept, right? There is so much, um, there is a degree of negativity around, oh, this is lab grown foods, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the fact that it looks almost indiscernible from the real thing is going to help us in a great and important way to scale cultivated meat from the lab um, into the real world. I think that is incredibly important uh, as a point uh, for why we think scaffolds are important. Additionally, of course, it's the texture, right? Again, a slimy monolayer is not going to have the same texture of meat. Um, Hence, we need to figure out ways to create meat products. Just one second. I'm just trying to like get rid of this chat box for a second. Um, yeah, cool. um, so that's why we think that uh, next step is the texture, right? So if you, if you want to avoid the slimy layer, you need something that's a sponge that has the same or similar texture you expect when you eat the product. So you've bought the product because it looks like chicken. Second thing is when you eat it, it should kind of feel like chicken in your mouth. If it doesn't feel like chicken in your mouth, you're a lot less likely to try it the next time around. Um, and so these two are kind of like the crux of why people need scaffolds in general. Um, and you, what kind of meat you're imitating 
uh, informs your choices for what kind of a scaffolding solution uh, you would like to go for, whether it is using some kind of nano, like, a, so just, I'll dive into like a side tangent. I'm sure Tom is going to cover this uh, in his uh, uh, topic. He has, he's just had a very ex excellent review that they published recently, I think. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, if you want to make a scaffold, you can do it from plant protein and extrude it in certain ways so that you can support cell adhesion, or you can do it from animal protein, which again, I assume defeats the purpose of you like getting into cultivated meat, or you can make recombinant versions of animal protein um, and then extrude them in ways that are desirable for cell adhesion, proliferation, et cetera, and for the meat-like texture. Or you can find plant-based proteins or fungal proteins, that's what we work with, um, in nature and try to figure out ways to make them make use of them as scaffolds. So that's what we do in, in, in a nutshell. But um, these other approaches also have their own kind of challenges and, and positive points, of course. Um, I'm sure Tom is going to kind of help us cover that a little bit later. But, excuse me. Yeah, there. So I talked about shape of meat. This is a MyoWorks uh, prototype of a shrimp. Uh, we've been working with using our 2D scaffold technology to make more three-dimensionalized products. And so um, just as a comparison, like if you looked at the slime in the first, first uh, slide versus this, this looks a lot more um, within the realm of food, within the realm of what we think uh, food to be. And so it's, it's an exciting opportunity for um, exciting an important thing for us that we can now make these interesting shapes. Um, oh yeah, and also Tom has put his link in the chat box so you guys can take a look at that paper. It's, it's quite good. Um, so yeah, that's just one second. Yeah. Uh, in addition to why like the central two premises of why scaffolds are necessary, i.e. Uh, the shape and the texture, there are a bunch of other things that you can do with scaffolds that uh, can help you uh, reduce costs, make better, more desirable products. So I've kind of put kind of two sub points into this. Um, first thing is helps with cost, right? So uh, as all of you know, cultivating cells to generate the mass is still an expensive affair. And of course, we're all working on reducing the cost of serum-free media formulations, figuring out how to recycle it, all these underlying challenges that go with it. But till such time as that is harder to achieve, it's a, scaffold is a very good, and, uh, good way to add mass to your final product. So if you, if you want to make a 100 gram piece of chicken, it's not necessary that you need to have 100 grams cells and that you know which leads to so much more media usage so much more um cost associated with growth factors albumin etc uh, whereas if you can figure out ways to use scaffolds as a way to create hybrid products that are actually just as tasty or if not tastier um that are better organized that have uh, everything that you would expect a meat, meat product to have and guess what because you saved so much weight um, not using, you know, 100% cells or 100% ECM, you can now offer a more competitive and lucrative pricing in the market. You have a much better chance of getting to market much quicker. Um, and so we think that this is an important piece of the puzzle, especially in the short term. In the long term, um, you know, we, we'll see where this journey kind of takes us uh, because scaffolds at the end of the day is like you want to give shape to the cells these are adherent cells, you put them in a scaffold, they're going to culture, they're going to occupy the negative space that you, that you provide to them. But at the same time, the gold standard should be uh, some kind of self assembly, right? Where you don't need a scaffold to grow the cells. Of course, that's a fairly intense technical, technological engineering life sciences challenge of how do you make cells grow on cue and assemble in these macroscopic shapes that they cannot in, in, in a petri dish as of today. So another very interesting challenge. And you know, if you want to look beyond from scaffolds today, um, that could be an interesting point to kind of look into how do you how do, you do self-assembly uh, for whole cut products? In addition to that, and I really want to talk about this as well, is a selective differentiation. So, um, so when we isolate cells from an animal and we could be isolating 
pluripotent stem cells or we could have induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so I'm assuming that people uh, who are in this track uh, kind of have a degree of familiarity with stem cells and how they can create different, different types of uh, mature cells um, subject to the growth factors and the conditions that they're subjected to. So we think that scaffolds can allow for that in very exciting ways. So if you engineer a scaffold to have certain growth factors in certain places, you can create pockets of fat or you can create pockets of um, muscle or you can create pockets of bone or, or connective tissue or uh, anything um, that you think will help create products that are more and more imitative of uh, the real thing of, of meat, right? Because meat is also a fairly complex structured product which has myotube bundles uh, coated with, uh, with extracellular matrix. There are pockets of fat within there. And uh, if we can create that at scale in a scalable process using uh, novel scaffolds, then that's going to be very valuable for our entire industry to kind of create, um, create these products and take them to market. Um, so this is kind of what I had prepared. Like I, I have a couple of slides in terms of uh, what we have been doing in MyOworks. I think you guys would be interested. So I figured I'll show a couple of slides. Um, so this is our 12 well plate kit, essentially of uh, scaffolds. They're uh, mycelium based uh, and they're like thin pieces of mycelium. You can seed your cells on top of it. And voila, if you see to your right, you can see a little bit, um, I like to call it a mouse nugget. Uh, I don't know how appetizing that vision is, but it, it is what it is, right? Um, so you see immediately, this is with a scaffold. And if we go back to our first slide, this is without a scaffold, right? Without a scaffold, all you have is a thin piece of um, very loosely packed cells. And what you have with a scaffold is a, a material that looks like a, a malformed nugget of sorts. Of course, nobody wants to eat mice. And so this or that doesn't make a lot of difference, but um, this is a great platform to show us, uh, okay, this is what a scaffold is adding, right? Uh, this is the value that scaffold brings with it. And um, we can do this and we have these kits. So if, if anyone in this track, you know, professors, people who have worked in life sciences, who work with cell biology, want to try these kits out, um, you know, we'd be happy to collaborate and try to take you through the process um, because we are trying to find collaborators and some data to put together for um, these kits. Additionally, just from a microscopic world, this is what our scaffolds look like. So if you see in the background there, that's the scaffolding material. And in the foreground, what you see are the mouse muscle cells kind of happily proliferating and uh, migrating around the scaffold surface. Um, so yeah, this is what I sort of had uh, as a prepared material. I figured we'd have some questions. So I'd, I'd be happy to take those. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, uh, Shubhankar. Uh, Probably, I think we can we can directly jump to Tom uh, for his presentation, and then we could take questions at the end. If that works. Okay, great. Over to you, Tom. Hey everyone. Um, so, in order to share my screen. Oh, excellent. So Shubka, Shub, uh, it's hard for me to pronounce the name. I always really have issues with that. So thank you so much for this uh, interesting uh, introduction. That really helps with my uh, lecture as well. So I will be discussing the, the scaffolding for tissue engineering of cultivated meat. Um, I will, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, by, my, by my colleague, um, uh, we just uh, produced uh, this uh, review paper that was uh, orchestrated and uh, the, uh, who, the person who did most of the work, Dr. Claire Bonkamps and Dr. Stacy Scalou, uh, a review paper, a wonderful review paper on uh, uh, cultivated meat scaffolding. I highly recommend the review with me. I'll discuss some uh, points from it. So, um, uh, uh, my colleague here uh, mentioned the, the texture and shape of uh, the importance of scaffolds for shape and texture. Uh, I would uh, also pitch the idea that uh, um, uh, culturing cells in 3D 
is uh, very important for uh, cell biology and tissue formation. Uh, so, you know, basically, if we want cells to behave naturally, we need the cells to have uh, the similar microenvironment as they would have in the body. Uh, if you think about the cell in the body, he, he, the cells are inside a 3D environment, some kind of a gel environment, and we want to recapitulate that so the cells will behave normally. This is important because uh, uh, the 3D environment uh, provide a ECM, uh, the extracellular matrix-like structure that is important for uh, the cell behavior. Uh, you can see here the differences between a cell that is grown in 2D and in 3D. Uh, in the 3D, you have the ECM around the cell, uh, allows the cells to behave. Uh, uh, this is the environment that the cells uh, knows. You have some kind of a gel from all of the around it. In addition to that, you can look at the cell morphology. Cells in 2D uh, are flattened on the surface, whereas in 3D, they can grow into all of the uh, directions that they uh, require. Um, uh, basically, the difference is that in the 2D and the 3D is that in the 2D, there is a very stiff surface on one side and a liquid with little mechanical properties on the other side. So the cells are flattened on this 2D surface, and this is a very unnatural condition for the cells, and it affects the, their proliferation, differentiation, and cell-cell interaction. Uh, it also generates this basal apical directionality uh, if you look at uh, 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 cells in the body, um, uh, you see the cells see uh, ECM for, uh, quite similar from all directions. Uh, here you can see that the integrins are only uh, stations at the bottom of the cells, whereas in the 3D, the integrins are all around it. So you, you can really see uh, differences in that, in as you mentioned, also the mechanical cues. And uh, lastly, um, uh, uh, gradients are uh, often lost. Uh, cells uh, uh, move around, they sense each other, uh, they get signals in terms of gradients. And uh, those diffuse throughout the gel, and that way uh, the uh, gel gets to the cells, and the cells know where they need to move. And this is very important when you are discussing a generation of tissues rather than cells growing individually. And uh, uh, if you have cells in a, on a plate, basically uh, the media mixes all the time, the gradients are lost, and that's not very uh, efficient in terms of uh, uh, the gradients are basically lost, uh, whereas they can be maintained when we are culturing the cells in 3D. In terms of cell-cell interactions, we can really understand it when we try to think how cells interact. Uh, in 2D cultures, if two cells interact, um, uh, they only, uh, if another cell approaches, it can only touch the side of the cell uh, at the edge of the membrane, whereas in 3D, the other cell can touch a much broader surface of the cell. And that really tells you how cells can interact in 3D, which is very different than in 2D. So um, let's discuss, a, so if we want to recapitulate meat, uh, as mentioned before, uh, we need to understand the meat structure. Meat is a skeletal muscle tissue composed mainly of uh, skeletal muscle fibers, but also some connection uh, tissue and fat. And in order to generate meat, we need to recapitulate all of these components uh, because otherwise we'll just have some uh, 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 meat materials, but not really meat. And uh, the scaffold can help uh, mimic the extracellular matrix portion of the meat. And specifically, the, uh, as we will see next, the, uh, the parts that uh, touches the cells, the endomysium and the perimysium. So if we look at meat, uh, meat has three, uh, three types of, uh, uh, three layers of uh, extracellular matrix, the epimysium that surrounds the entire muscle, the perimysium that uh, compartmentalize the fascicles of uh, uh, muscle bundles, fascicles are muscle bundles, and the endomysium is the portion that you see here between the muscle fibers, basically fills the gap between the muscle fibers. Uh, the ECM is mainly com uh, composed of collagen fibers and hydrated proteolicans. Um, uh, and let's discuss a little bit the two parts of the ECM that are important to us. Let's uh, not discuss the epimysium because it's not that important. So we have the perimysium that we saw before, the um, uh, orange areas here. Uh, basically that's 90% of the extracellular matrix. Um, uh, and it has certain sizes 
that are uh, important for us. And this is when we discuss uh, scaffolds, especially for scaffolds, where this is basically what we are trying to recapitulate, the paramecium, uh, which has some kind of a structural role and mechanical roles. Um, uh, if we um, uh, discuss the endomysium on the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the endomysium is the basement membrane. Uh, it, uh, it supports with cell matrix interactions, also cell-cell interactions. Uh, composed, uh, if we talk about collagens, we see a lot of collagen four and five that uh, have a, a heparin sulfate, laminins, uh, very thin. And this is basically uh, has uh, some biochemical, also mechanical roles, but uh, a lot of, uh, bio, of the biochemical roles. This uh, is the area that actually touches the cells. And, uh, and there are specific molecules in it that uh, provide the uh, biochemical cues that are important for the cells. So uh, uh, we use scaffolds, the, basically we use them in order to grow cells in a 3D environment that mimics the 3D environment of the uh, tissue. Uh, the scaffolds needs to be porous, and they should have mechanical strength, they need to be cytocompatible, uh, not harm the cells, so the cells can survive in them. So an optimal scaffold will have both the porous structure that we see here, and uh, that provide the mechanical cues and hold the the structure, uh, the shape of the uh, uh, tissue, as mentioned before by Schumann Carr, um, and the, the protein gel that provide the uh, biochemical cue. The biochemical cues and they help cells uh, uh, grow naturally in the 3D environment. So you can see from this that uh, the scaffold uh, uh, might recapitulate the uh, perimysium, whereas the protein gel might uh, recapitulate the endomysium inside it. So let's discuss a little bit about the uh, scaffold types. Um, uh, we mentioned here the porous scaffolds and the hydrogel, uh, but let's uh, uh, see uh, different types and their combinations. So if we talk about uh, environments where we can culture cells, we can culture cells in porous scaffolds as we saw before. We can culture cells inside hydrogels, inside the uh, uh, fiber scaffolds uh, and, and using 3D printing. We won't go over the 3D printing because I'm sure all of you heard a lot about that. Uh, we'll go a very little, uh, discuss it very uh, quickly, but we'll discuss the other ones in more length. So the porous scaffold, as we mentioned before, provide the, it, they are sponge-like materials. They generate uh, structures that can recapitulate the perimysium uh, in a sense that we, we want cells to generate their own ECM. However, the perimysium is a certain uh, ECM that is, it has lots of ECM in it and, it's, and it has a specific structure that is not likely for the cells to produce themselves. So we add it externally and uh, that's something that we need to know that it, it uh, has a significant portion of the final product and it may, it may, be, uh, may stay there. So that's something to consider in terms of the uh, properties and perhaps using something that is uh, more uh, suitable for a, a, as part of the final product in terms of the nutritional value, texture, and a flavor. So in this uh, paper, that uh, uh, one of our papers, we show the use of a TVP, textured vegetable protein, as a scaffolding material for a culture, cultivated meat. Um, something the, uh, valuable about the pore scaffold is if they have large uh, pores, they can be used also for uh, media perfusion and the scaffold uh, itself uh, provide the mechanical stability that holds the tissue together. Um, another uh, um, uh, option is uh, in addition to the porous scaffolds are hydrogels. So in tissue engineering, we work a lot with hydrogels. They are uh, composed of a uh, hydrophilic um, uh, polymer matrix that can absorb uh, water, over 90% water. And hydrogels can resemble the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix itself is some kind of a hydrogen. And because of that, uh, hydrogels are very interesting uh, for our purposes. They should be cytocompatible. They should allow a diffusion of, a, 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 of molecules through them. That's an important property of the hydrogels, uh, the, uh, the velocity of a uh, the diffusion of the uh, uh, molecules in it. 
we need to also assess the mechanical properties. If they, um, um, uh, if the gel is too stiff, then the cells will not grow when they need it. Um, uh, it can, the hydrogen stiffness can affect the cell growth, differentiation, and, and the cell motility, uh, which is important in order to actually allow cells to generate tissues. Uh, cells cannot migrate or proliferate in hydrogels which are too stiff. And this also uh, uh, relates to the degradation kinetics. We want a hydrogel to be an initial uh, replacement for the endomysium and allow the cells to generate their own ECM over time. So adding some kind of fibroblasts that produce ECM is also important. Um, uh, we don't want a, a gel that uh, degrades over, uh, after five minutes and we don't want it to remain over one year. So we want something in the middle over a few uh, weeks of degradation and uh, perhaps uh, also adding some uh, options of a, a, a break points uh, for, that allow the cells to um, a, 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 a break down the hydrogel uh, using uh, some of the uh, enzymes that they produce in the kind of proteins. So some uh, uh, important attributes for cultivated meat in terms of hydrogels is the cost of the hydrogel, uh, food grade, uh, be, in food grade and uh, also providing the nutritional value in case that they are uh, ma maintained as part of the scaffold. Um, something important for hydrogels in uh, cultivated meat or in uh, tissue engineering in general is cell compatible gelation because we introduce the cells into the uh, gel solution before we solidify the gel. And if the gelling will uh, occur in conditions that are cytotoxic, the cells will not survive. The scaffold itself uh, that we saw before uh, can be uh, generated in toxic conditions, just the final product should uh, be uh, cytocompatible. Whereas in hydrogels, not only the final uh, product should be uh, cytocompatible, the, uh, the, the conditions in which it is produced should be cytocompatible as well, uh, the gelation itself should be cytocompatible. So several uh, uh, ways to uh, 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 polymerize gels in a cytocompatible manners are uh, gelation in room temperature. There are uh, some materials that can be liquid in low temperature in around four to four degrees. And when we heat them up to room temperature, they uh, polymerize and form gels. This could be matrigel, collagen, some other uh, extracellular matrix solutions. And the issue with those uh, is that they are not food grade or they are expensive, uh, but perhaps we can find other alternatives for gels that can uh, uh, undergo gelation at a uh, room temperature compared to um, uh, four degrees. Uh, if they, we can find some uh, uh, materials like that from uh, bacteria, from microorganisms, or from plants that could be very valuable for uh, as a, a, a some kind of a gel for hydrogel for a tissue engineering for cultivated meat. Other options are enzymatic cleavage. Uh, for example, fibrin that we, we, that we often use um, uh, in uh, the lab. Uh, fibrin uh, starts as a fibrinogen, is a, a molecule that is a, a liquid uh, that can be a part of a solution. It could be a solution in the room temperature. And when we add the enzyme thrombin, uh, the fibrinogen is cleaved and generating fibrin that, uh, that cross links into a gel. So again, fibrin is something that we might not want to use because it is kind of expensive in animal source, but we can think of, theoretically about enzymatic cleavage as a way to generate uh, the gels. Another option is ionic cross-linking, as we know with alginate. Alginate could be a solution that in the presence of calcium ions uh, undergo cross-linking. So that's another option for a, a cell compatible gelation. Uh, ions uh, used here are calcium, which is a little bit toxic for the cells, but, may, but maybe that's okay uh, if we do it, uh, if we don't use it to be high of concentrations. Uh, another option is the UV curing uh, using photo initiators. So using a uh, UV light when they uh, render it, uh, it's also a little bit toxic for the cells and the, photo, uh, and the photo initiator is also a little bit toxic, but uh, researchers say that that's okay. You don't use too much time. You don't uh, do it for a very, uh, you use a, 
uh, low energy UV light, so uh, that's perhaps not that bad. Um, uh, so the, but this is another valuable approach in order to generate uh, gels. Uh, so hydrogels uh, could be used uh, as, a, as some kind of a scaffolding materials in terms of culturing the cells inside them, basically providing a 3D microenvironment that resembles the extracellular long matrix, can resemble uh, provided biochemical cues that are required that are similar to the endomysium. Um, uh, however, uh, sometimes, most of the times, hydrogel have low mechanical properties. Um, and, uh, and they require cytocompatible gelation. As we mentioned before, an example, a good example is the fibrin gel. You can see here a wonderful work of how they used hydrogels in order to, to create this really wonderful uh, 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 tissues, uh, uh, skeletal muscle tissues. Um, yeah, um, I will mention it later. So another option is fiber scaffolds using a uh, either electrospinning or other uh, 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 techniques, or perhaps using some uh, uh, materials in nature that are uh, intrinsically fibrous, such as fibers from plants or uh, mycelium. Uh, it's, they are favorable because they have an uh, intrinsic anisotropy. They are basically fibers in the realm of, in the uh, uh, cell dimensions. And that's important because if you can functionalize them, you can, find, you can really tune the behavior of the cells, not the average cell, but each cell, uh, but the specific cells that we're seeing or a uh, single uh, uh, fiber resolution. And that's quite interesting, perhaps generating different fibers with different cell types and so on. And they also generate a very interesting fiber structure that is important for uh, cultivated meat and uh, alternative proteins. Um, 3D printing, I won't discuss it because you all know it. Uh, I'll just mention that it is very favorable in terms of the tunable structure and generate any structure that you are interested in in good resolution. However, the very large issue with 3D bioprinting is that it is one of the slowest way that you can use in order to produce anything. Perhaps there will be um, adv uh, advances in the future that will make it more scalable. But currently, uh, they, that's a, a big issue, especially when we think about uh, cell culture. Um, if you uh, put the cells uh, inside of a solution that you want to uh, seed into a, you cannot hold the cells inside of a, basically you have adherent cells, you need to uh, trypsinize them, you need to harvest them and put them in this solution that you want to, um, that you want to 3D print, and you cannot hold them in this solution for a very long time. Um, cells will not uh, behave normally that way. So that's still of an issue. However, there are merits because you can really uh, fine tune your samples using that. Something to consider that we, we saw before but we didn't mention it is the combination of the different uh, scaffolding uh, types. Uh, for example, using a, a combination of a porous scaffold and a fill in hydrogen, generating a, an environment that mimics the, the perimysium and the endomysium. So uh, for example, that's what we used in the, in, in the TVP scaffolds. We used TVP as a perimysium-like uh, structure. And inside it, we used fibrin gel so that the cells can grow inside the pores of the scaffold. And that's uh, something that should be considered. Another, perhaps another direction is using fibrous uh, scaffolds that we saw before inside of a hydrogel. Uh, basically, uh, perhaps even a combination of the three of them could be very interesting uh, approach. Um, if we think about uh, the designing uh, scaffolds and uh, design tissue in general, we need to understand what we are starting uh, from uh, protocols and materials that uh, at least they initially started from the tissue engineering for regenerative medicine. Uh, tissue engineering for regenerative medicine uses cells, biomaterials, and signaling molecules in order to generate tissues that are supposed to be uh, transplanted into the body. And that gives us a lot of in, uh, valuable uh, uh, beginning to start generating cultivated meat. 
However, the, there are some uh, differences between uh, tissue engineering for uh, generative medicine compared to cultivated meat. So in uh, regenerative medicine, we, one of the key uh, issues is prevention of immune response. Because you are going to transplant the tissue inside the body, uh, many of the materials were optimized and developed uh, so they will prevent immune response. Uh, 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 and that's something that is irrelevant for uh, cultivated meat. Uh, in addition, uh, materials that uh, degrade uh, after transplantation uh, in a well manner, which uh, in cultivated meat, uh, uh, we can, uh, the, the entire tissue goes into your uh, uh, in your stomach and it will be degraded in a much easier manner compared to a tissue that goes into, that is transplanted and that's a, something a much easier for the body to degrade. However, you do need to consider the fact that in cultivated meat, you consume a much larger a sample compared to a regenerative medicine where you usually don't use a, that a large of a, a tissue. In addition to that, uh, regenerative medicine focuses heavily on uh, post-transplantation -trans uh, viability. It is simple to culture a tissue in the lab in, in, in vitro conditions where you have lots of me rich media. However, lots of considerations are focused on what will happen after you transplant the tissue into the body, um, especially a very fo large focus on vascularization with cells that can afterwards uh, connect to the host vasculature, which is not that important. It's not important when you are uh, not going to transplant the tissue. Also focus on human and rodent cells. 99% um, uh, of tissue engineering is done with human and rodent cells. Um, when we think about cultivated meat, we need to focus on cost, on scale, uh, which are much larger issues compared to regenerative medicine. We need to focus on the texture of the tissues, uh, in some of the images that we saw before, we saw scaffolds that are made for a, a, a regenerative medicine, and they are ma made from plastic, and biodegradable plastic that degrades in your body. For cultivated meat, we cannot use them. And because of that, for example, we use the TVP, which is, a, has the texture that is at least supposed to mimic a meat. TVP is a a byproduct of a, a, it's basically a raw material of the plant-based meat industry. So in that sense, we think that that's a better material compared to plastic at least. Uh, in addition to that, focus on flavor, uh, 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 doing more research on that, that was never a fo focus area for regenerative medicine. In addition, nutritional value, uh, same as intramuscular fat, uh, culturing uh, adipose cells, not that big of a focus in regenerative medicine. Uh, perhaps there is a focus, a little bit focus on fat for cosmetics. Uh, however, not. Uh, however, if you discuss uh, uh, generating tissues, muscle tissues with fat in them, uh, no one wants to transplant fat. So that's another thing that we need to focus on: for cultures of adipocytes and uh, fat cells. In addition, focus on farm animal cells and food grade and animal free biomaterials. Um, when we want to quantify uh, uh, the success of our measure uh, of our uh, experiments, we want to quantify uh, novel uh, traits. But we use some uh, uh, but, uh, uh, measurement tools that are common in the in the tissue engineering area. However, we want to <coughs> also measure uh, additional uh, parameters. For example, for quantifying texture we can use a texture measurement such as WBSF or TPA. Uh, I would mention the, so WBSF uh, basically has this uh, structure. It goes down and, uh, and try to cut uh, the sample uh, and measure the forces in order to quantify the texture. In the texture profile analyzer, that's a, this uh, technique tries to uh, mimic two bytes into a sample, as you can see here in this uh, graph and measure the forces during that. Um, it has been suggested that the, the, the texture profile analyzer is more reliable for measurements of raw samples. However, when uh, comparing both uh, 
something that uh, the WBSF may be preferable for, for example. However, a recent uh, report showed that uh, also when measured cook samples uh, and uh, comparing that to uh, 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 consumer uh, measurements, uh, 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 so that uh, the texture profile analyzer uh, was also found as a, as a good um, uh, predictor or a better predictor than the WSBF also for the cooked samples. So in general, we see that TPA is a better predictor of, a, of a, a, a sample quality. In general, a texture profile analyzer is a better predictor of juiciness and hardness, while the WBSF is found to be a better predictor of the springiness. However, the, both the juiciness and hardness are more valuable valued by the consumers. Um, in the paper that uh, we uh, refer to, there are uh, reference values for meat texture of different species of animals. Uh, uh, so if you are interested in this kind of measurements, you might want to use that as well. Uh, another option commonly used is the Young modulus, where in order to quantify the uh, mechanical properties of the tissue. Um, in addition to that, when we want to quantify 3D samples, there are other techniques uh, beside texture. Uh, confocal microscopy uh, allows you to measure fluorescent uh, samples in 3D. Um, uh, uh, if you don't want to measure the samples in 3D, you can use also price sections, basically cutting your sample into thin slices and then doing measurements on them using either histology or fluorescent measurements and so on. In addition to that, you can perform protein and RNA extraction and analyze them. Alarmar blue is another interesting uh, technique that allows you to measure how it's not a very, uh, you can uh, basically tell you how healthy the sample is, how the number of cells, it's generally correlated with the number of cells. It basically measures the reduction potential of your sample. The more cells you have, the more reduction potential. The healthier the cells are, the more NADH the cells have, the uh, higher the reduction potential. So that's another measurement to, that is a very simple uh, and doesn't affect your sample uh, in order to quantify how healthy your sample is. And also you can analyze the media. So that's another option to quantify samples in 3D. Um, let's discuss a little bit the uh, scaffolding techniques. Um, so the PLA PLJ scaffold that we saw before are generated using salt leaching. Um, uh, this is an example uh, of a scaffold that is used like this. This is a, a technique used in order to generate hydrophobic uh, uh, scaffolds, uh, porous scaffolds. Basically, you take a hydrophobic solution and a hydrophobic polymer that will generate your uh, final sample, and you add to so you mix them together with salt particles. The salt particles will generate the pores that you will have at the end. So when you combine the three of them, you will generate a polymer solution with the salt particles. And if now you dry the solvent, what you will be left with is the salt particles inside of a polymer uh, construct. And if you wash this uh, with water, basically you will get a, a, a scaffold like this, that each uh, thing that you see here, that's uh, where a salt particle was. That's one uh, technique. Another technique is melt molding, very similar but easier to understand. Uh, basically, you take uh, pieces of a polymer, you uh, put them with a, a salt particles, you heat them until the polymer dissolves, uh, and then you get a construct of the polymer with salt particles, which you can then wash and generate a, 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 a scaffold, a porous scaffold as we saw before. Another technique is freeze drying. Uh, you take, a, a, this is for hydrophilic uh, um, uh, some uh, scaffolds. You, you take a polymer solution and you freeze it uh, and while uh, you freeze it slowly and while the solvent slowly generate the ice crystals, the polymer is deposited between the crystals. And if we re then remove the ice crystals by sublimations, we will get an image like the one that uh, you see here on the right a connected polymer formed around the ice crystals. 
And this is an example how uh, you can create a scaffold from a polymer. Um, in this uh, paper, this is an interesting uh, technique where you can basically uh, 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 generate these uh, um, uh, structures using a temperature gradient. This temperature gradient uh, generates a directionality of the ice crystals formation, which results in a directionality of the polymer structure. And this is relevant for uh, tissue engineering for coin muscle fibers, which uh, <coughs> differentiate better when having such a directionality. Uh, another example of generating scaffold using freeze drying, uh, not a hydrogel, but still, uh, this lab used the tofu as a scaffolding material. They freeze dried the tofu and generated a porous uh, scaffold. Uh, in which they grew mice cells uh, for regenerative medicine purposes, not for cultivated meat, even though it's tofu. But this is an interesting co uh, concept. Uh, this is an example of how you can freeze dry edible materials. And if you have something simple, you can uh, freeze dry it and perhaps it will work. Uh, lastly, I will mention uh, uh, this interesting uh, direction of gas forming. You basically take a, a solution that contains the polymer that you, uh, that, uh, you want to generate the poly, uh, the, the scaffold form and a surfactant. Um, you uh, mix it until you get uh, these uh, bubbles uh, and, uh, that are stable. And if the gelation uh, happens inside of the, uh, inside the form that you have here, we will maintain the structure of uh, this porous structure that we see here, and then we can generate uh, the gels that uh, we are interested in. The advantage is that it's kind of scalable, and it can also fill the, uh, uh, the uh, container that it's inside. It could be interesting for scalable processes. And so I was meant to finish here. However, if there is a, a little bit more time, I can continue. Uh, Certainly, probably, probably you can continue for like five or ten minutes max. Oh. Okay, so I will go over a little bit about biomaterials for um, alternative for cultivated meat. And if whatever I don't finish, you can just say uh, watch it. It will be in the PDF that you will see here. Yeah, so, probably five minutes. Five minutes. Sure. Thank you. So let me go over. So let me. I will skip this one. I'll just mention fibrin that we mentioned before. Uh, it's an interesting material for uh, cultivated uh, meat uh, scaffolding. It's a protein. Uh, and, uh, and, and interesting is natural. It's basically naturally an occurring fibrous protein that forms a broad crust on Indrajit side, meaning that fibrin gel is a. It's biologically designed to be a temporary scaffold for tissue engineering. This is the biological one. Basically, it degrades over the days in uh, cell media. And because of that, it is commonly used as a hydrogel for uh, uh, muscle uh, tissue engineering. Uh, its advantages include being a natural biomaterial that undergo gelation under mild conditions that are okay for the cells. And it degrades over two weeks, making it a successful candidate for tissue engineering. Its disadvantages is that it's animal sourced or very expensive. However, you can try to think about uh, uh, other materials that can behave like uh, fibrin and generate something similar. And collagen, you all probably know. I, I won't go over it. However, this is a key material uh, in the uh, in uh, um, uh, in a tissue uh, in a skeletal muscle tissue. Also, hyaluronic acid that uh, is quite valuable. Um, let me, these are a few examples for a temporal uh, and tunable stiffness, special tunable stiffness. I won't go over them. I didn't mean to go over them. Um, however, I would uh, mention also a uh, matrigen. Uh, something important if you are trying to start uh, uh, your experiments, a uh, matrigen is a very nice material that works great. Um, cells love it. Uh, they grow. Uh, and it gels in mild conditions. However, uh, you cannot use it for, a, a, for a commercial purposes. It's not food right. However, it's good for you for initial uh, experimentation in order to make sure that, you're, uh, that something works. A uh, thing will grow really well in it. So for your initial experimentation, you might want to use matrigel as a, 
as an initial material for experiments. And perhaps if it's uh, totally removed during the process, perhaps your experiments will be able to go for a, for a commercialization as well. But uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, be, uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, be sure about that. Um, lastly, I will mention this paper that uh, uses um, a, a basically Algenac as a way to generate um, a, um, a, a hollow uh, fibers uh, that where you can uh, culture cells uh, in a hollow alginate uh, tubes. Basically, you have this, um, uh, you have cells inside media and around it, you, you flow it into a calcium bath. You throw, flow also alginate into the calcium bath. Alginate, uh, when it uh, sees the uh, calcium, it, uh, generate, it polymerizes into a gel. In that way, you can generate a hollow, a, a hollow, a, 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 a tube of alginate with cells inside, and that's quite interesting. If we can think about culturing skeletal muscle cells inside it, you can also afterwards dissolve the outer shell and just may maintain the cells inside it. Uh, that's also interesting for subcultures, and that's an interesting concept when you are uh, discussing. Uh, culturing uh, cells uh, in a uh, scalable manner. So I will stop here. You will have also these slides uh, as well. And thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom uh, and Shubhanka for your wonderful presentations. <clears throat> we have a bunch of questions um, which have come across and I have a few for you as well. We can probably talk towards my questions at the end, but uh, Let's just quickly jump into these questions. Shailendra Rani, a participant, has asked at what stage differentiated versus undifferentiated cells are seeded in the scaffolds? I mean, uh, Tom and Shivanka, please feel free to answer these questions, uh, both of you, or anyone can answer. So I will call out names here. Uh, yeah, sure. If I can hazard, a, I can hazard an answer. That's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, usually when we talk about scaffolds, it's usually that you seed like a final population of undifferentiated cells into the scaffold and then get them to differentiate on the scaffold. So specifically for muscle, uh, you're going to be putting the muscle progenitor cells um, onto the scaffold and then uh, differentiate them into, into uh, myotubes. Tom, any question? Sorry, can you repeat the question? At what stage? I mean, the participant is basically asking at what stage, whether it should be the differentiated or undifferentiated stage where cells, uh, where, where, when should we actually see these cells? Put the on codes? this, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't try to uh, see the differentiated muscle cells into the scaffold because differentiated muscle cells are basically muscle fibers, and those will be. Uh, you cannot really work with them that well. They are not like, okay, when you center region, what is going to happen? Their size is a kind of a variable. You can start with a initial differentiation of the cells, uh, giving them some initial cues in order to prevent them from being quinescent and then seeding them. However, I would say starting with stem cells, that's the, the general, uh, starting with the stem cell, that's the general way. However, for each project that could be a little bit different, perhaps there are some females. Specifically, if you are talking about skeletal muscle, if you are talking about other cell types, that might be a little bit different. Thanks, Tom and uh, Shubhanka. Uh, the next question is, how is induction for cell proliferation by growth factor done? Considering penetration issues, basically how these growth factors would penetrate the complex tissue. I think that's a question in the scaffold. So I, I can uh, start with that. So um, uh, I don't think that there, if there are penetration issues, then uh, uh, you, you won't be able to also feed the cells. So that's a general issue beside just the differentiation. Something that is, we are lucky to have is that muscle cells differentiate under starvation conditions. So the <laughs> So the fact that you have some kind of penetration issue might be something that is interesting. However, you should always be able to diffuse a, 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 
grow factors or other materials into your sample. If you don't have that, then you will have bigger issues than just differentiation. Basically, having both porous, uh, porous, scaffold, porous uh, structure that allows media perfusion or perfusing the media form around it, that's, that's diffusion of uh, uh, molecules that's key for scaffolding. Yeah, same, like if it's a porous scaffold, media should transport in, the growth factors are actually hardly a problem. Like glucose and stuff goes in, growth factors should go in. Yes, um, makes complete sense to me. Uh, the next question is what are, I mean, which are some of the natural scaffolds uh, which have been used so far? I think, I think Shailendra wants to ask basically, which of these natural, uh, naturally occurring scaffolds or materials have been used so far by probably startups? Uh, if you can make it a bit more specific, but um, yeah, I mean, if you guys want to answer this question, just fine, otherwise we can move forward. I can say a little bit that, that there are uh, lots of information about in the review paper, both uh, texture of vegetable protein, uh, decellularized plants, polysaccharides, lots of uh, materials that stems from animals such as collagen and such, but uh, polysaccharides I would focus on, on uh, such as uh, alginate, pectin, and so on. And, um, and the other uh, uh, biomaterials that can generate uh, hydrogels. You can watch them also in the presentation slides and also in other. Something interesting that when you are uh, generating fibrous scaffolds, you might want to use also as the mycelium or other, um, uh, or add, you can basically electrospin different types of materials such as uh, proteins uh, and, uh, and other materials uh, to generate fibrous scaffolds. Thanks Tom, for that. Uh, so Swapnil is asking how is induction for cell proliferation by growth factor done? I think we covered this. But anyways, uh, how is induction for cell proliferation by growth factor done? So, considering penetration issues, how is and there are three questions. The, the first one is induction for cell proliferation uh, and penetration issues. The second one is aeration done in scaffolds. How is it basically done? And how is contamination detected? I think the other, like the first one is, uh, like Tom and I answered that one, like, you know, if, if the yeah. media can transport through, it's good. Uh, aeration also is about, you know, if, if your porosity is there and if you're using maybe some kind of perfusion system, like that's more, more of a bioreactor question, I guess. Like, how are you making sure that the media and aeration and stuff kind of goes all the way through? Um, the last one though, contamination is always, uh, kind of evergreen problem. I saw Tom like smiling there, which is, uh, you know, yeah, it happens. Uh, you just have to be able to on, be on your toes. Uh, if your media is like discoloring too often, uh, you know, if it's going yellow, which if it's supposed to do that in a couple of days, if it's doing it in four hours, you probably have contamination. Uh, if you have some kind of, um, you know, some kind of debris, or if you see some haziness in your media, this is probably an indication of contamination. And then you can always, you know, uh, take a bit of a sample, put it in a microscope, see what's floating around in your media um, and find the answer to that. So that's how you detect contamination. I think there is no like evergreen way. Uh, yeah. I would add to that that, uh, first of all, if you have contamination, you will know about this, don't worry. That will, uh, <laughs> that will go exponentially. Um, just try to uh, prevent that. Uh, regarding the uh, growth factors, uh, something interesting is trying to add, attach, uh, uh, provide, uh, to uh, have the growth factors stabilized by the, by the scaffold itself with uh, some kind of uh, glycoproteins uh, or uh, uh, proteoglycans that uh, bind the, um, uh, the growth factors and stabilize them. And that way you can uh, uh, generally reduce the amount of growth factors that are required. And that's something that could be valuable for the field. Uh, regarding the aeration, uh, if we have scaffolds that are inside of perfusion bioreactors, then the media will perfuse throughout the scaffold. And that way you can uh, uh, provide nutrients and oxygen to the cells inside of your uh, scaffold. Yeah, thank you for the answers. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, also, in, that, in terms of aeration, uh, how is it done in scaffolds? I think we can um, touch up on this point, right? 
validation basically. So could you guys answer this question? Perhaps yeah. I think we covered it uh, basically perfusion bioreactors uh, diffuse the oxygen throughout the scaffold. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, Swatim has a question can we use universal testing machine to study strength and texture? So, the universal testing machine is basically a machine which is used to test for tensile strength and uh, strength of materials. Uh, so, are there any insights here, Tom? One issue here is to consider the fact that we are using, I, I'm not sure what is the, the universal testing machine. However, something to consider is the size of the samples. Basically, when you are doing tissue engineering, you want to have the smallest sample possible because for each sample, you need to have a million cells or two million cells. And you, when you are doing your experiments, you are trying to optimize, so you might have in your experiment like 50 scaffolds or 20 scaffolds. And for that, you want the smallest sam uh, sample possible. And if your machine, there are machines that measure meat texture and they are using 50 grams of meat as the sample. And for cultivated meat, the samples are 1000 times smaller. So try to uh, think about the machines that are optimized for small samples. For example, in Tufts University, uh, Fish et al, they generated a WSBF uh, machine uh, that is meant for scaffolds. So cast, generate, because in the meat industry, there was never a reason to measure texture in 50 milligrams uh, samples. Because the, in the meat industry, what is one gram of meat? That's nothing. But here we cannot just generate uh, 50 grams of meat for every sample. So that's something to consider. What is the minimal size of the samples that you can have? And perhaps optimize the machine or a, find a machine that can generate can measure things in a much much smaller scale. Yeah, I think the UTM. Uh, we we actually did try this with a hydrogel thing we were trying out. Um, I think UTM is like widely available to test like materials like me, me metal and like plastics and stuff. So short answer, we really need to look at the scale of things. Usually these ranges start at like maybe you know, 20 kilopascal, 100 kilopascal up. Uh, it's not going to work out for uh, meat or anything that's tissue related. I speak from experience. I've like crushed uh, hydrogel at a local engineering college. Uh, it was gory. We had to clean their place up. But yeah, don't do that. Thank you. I think that is a um, slightly related question. At what frequency of thickness of the hole should analysis be performed? Both cellular and quantitative, sorry, qualitative. We usually use in the lab uh, samples of around two millimeters. I would try to aim to that uh, thickness, uh, maybe a little bit higher, a little bit lower, but that's the general uh, direction. At least when you are uh, trying to use uh, to grow uh, uh, small samples that are not inside the bioreactors. If you are trying to use a uh, larger ones, perhaps theoretically you can use other material, uh, other techniques. Maybe, maybe you can use uh, things like uh, ultrasound or uh, MRI in order to try to quantify uh, uh, a maturation like that. But uh, uh, that's uh, things that should be a little bit more novel. Uh, and perhaps they can be able to measure things in the larger samples or even inside of the bioreactor because uh, uh, ultrasound is very inexpensive and you can just put it inside the bioreactor and try to use it. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so Yadidya has a question, apart from scaffolding materials, is it possible practically to promote is it, is it possibly practical to ask the cells to produce ECM by using ECM promoting factors? And also, if you can also give insights on profiling of cells with fibroblasts, which produce collagen ECM. I think it's in, in relation to scaffolds, probably. Yeah, I think um, it's. I think it, it, any strategy will include this piece of the puzzle as well, like co-culturing. Um, especially because like the initial attachment and stuff, 
uh, provided by scaffolds is good and necessary. But if you want to have the same kind of nutrition and the other um, aspects of creating, you know, the, the images that Tom showed, like endomysium, perimysium, uh, you need the fibroblasts to be there. You need the ECM to be there. So yeah, it's it's absolutely necessary. But um, it, maybe you could be the one to do this. But we, I haven't at least thought of a way to um, kind of do a co-culture that does a self-assembly um, without needing a scaffold at all. Sort of. Right? Does that answer your question? I, I would add uh, and say that fibroblasts, in my opinion, are a, a must. They are a, in our uh, research we. We showed how uh, beneficial adding cells that produce ECM are important uh, also for the growth of the other cells. They make the other cells behave better, behave more naturally. They make the, uh, uh, the scaffold itself more robust, uh, make the uh, a complex ECM that actually resemble the ECM of the skeletal muscle. So adding fibroblasts, and, and in addition to that, fibroblasts are very easy to culture. They are like the easiest ones, uh, perhaps except for cancer cells. They are very easy to culture. And in my opinion, you don't just need to add fibroblasts. You need to add several types of fibroblasts. If you can add a little bit of each fibroblast so they can generate a complex ECM, they perhaps some embryonic uh, fibroblast, skeletal muscle fibroblast, with a little bit of each, so you'll have a very interesting um, ECM. Because something to consider is that uh, if you have skeletal muscle fibroblasts, they are uh, found in the tissue after the tissue is already created. So they are remodeling the tissue. However, you might want to also have the earlier uh, fibroblasts that will generate the initial T uh, ECM and also the later one. So having a combination of fibroblasts, in my opinion, is something very important in order to generate a tissue that actually resembles me. That's a good point. Yeah, thanks, thanks both. Uh, and for the participants, if you have any follow-up questions to your questions or any other them, you can just raise your hand now or later and you can just go live to ask a question. Uh, the next question is, uh, yeah, I think there are a couple of questions about the market for scaffold. Uh, so I think Shubhanka, you're the best person to answer this, but Tom, please feel free to chime in as well. Yeah, um, so as I said, and as, as Tom also mentioned, scaffolds are absolutely necessary to create macroscopic pieces of meat. So there is a real need in the market. Uh, so long as we believe that cultivated meat is you know, going to scale up, there is a need for scaffolds, um, definitely. So the, the market for scaffolds for cultivated meat is directly tethered to the cultivated meat market itself. And uh, the future looks bright because if you look at it from a, uh, the, from a food perspective, you will see like in the, from a consumer standpoint, there's a lot of diversification, a lot of different brands, a lot of different providers, lots of variety. Uh, whereas the back end, you know, the B2B supply chains are fairly more consolidated. Um, so I think something similar will happen to the input products of cultivated meat, where you would have a lot of uh, consumer facing companies for cultivated meat who are trying to create, you know, chicken and this kind of chicken and that shape of chicken and this, shape of beef and that shape of beef, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all of them will have some degree of consolidation towards the need of scaffolds. So uh, scaffolds is a great market to be in if, you, if you're generally interested in cultivating it. I would add to that that most, uh, uh, almost everyone, everyone is unanimous about the fact that cultivated meats will start up as hybrid products. And because of that, um, uh, thinking of the scaffold as the hybrid side of the product, uh, making a scaffold that will make sense go well, that could be a key, if you can generate the best, if you can think about the computers with Intel inside, if you can make the scaffold that will be suited for cell cultures and will be able to, that you can put the cells inside and the cells will grow well, you will have the right porosity and you will have the right texture. I would say that that's a very key portion of the, of the tissue engineering itself. If you can generate something like that and every time uh, make the scaffold better every time, making the scaffolds uh, have also flavor and uh, nutritional value, perhaps generating polymers that uh, will degrade during cooking into flavor molecules. Uh, we think about polymers that degrade into monomers. Uh, in tissue engineering, we think about polymers that degrade into things that will uh, be safe for the body. We need to think about polymers that will degrade into materials that will be uh, tasty. And if we can generate something like that, and every time generate a scaffold that is better and better and better, 
uh, maybe that's the most in, the the most the largest part of the cultivated meat the uh, final product. And because of that, I think there is lots of a uh, market for that, especially when we are discussing hybrid products. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those insights, Shubankar and Tom. So we have a few more questions. Uh, uh, Asta is asking: Are micro carriers also required along with scaffolds for proper structure and suspension cultures, or just scaffolds are sufficient enough? Uh, I'm a little confused about this question, but uh, if you guys are also confused, we can ask Asta to ask this question live. Yeah, sure. That would be helpful, I think. Yeah, Asta, uh, please raise your hand and we can hand you. Okay, uh, um, in the meanwhile, Shailendra Rani also has a question Can microbial grown polypeptides be used um, for scaffolds? Um, I would say that theoretically, yes. However, they are tending to be a little bit expensive. So as long as, they, if I understand correctly, that's like precision fermentation generating like collagen, the combinant collagen, for example. So theoretically, yes, just uh, you need to consider the price. They should be around, uh, for the if the final product for one kilogram of a uh, final product, you need to be on the range of uh, 10 cents per kilogram of final product. So if the concentration is rather low, then that could be, sometimes you can add a little bit of something and, and it had, adds a lot. Uh, for example, the elastic properties or something like that. But if you can add a little bit of that, that and it could have a major effect then that could work, that could fit. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh... So for this question, for the micro carriers and scaffolds question, um, I, I'm sure Tom can answer it uh, better as well, but essentially people, uh, the way people are thinking about this problem uh, right now is that the microcarrier usage is in the early stage, uh, whereby you're creating uh, proliferation, making proliferation happen, you're increasing your cell count, um, where they're amorphous or they're like beads or really tiny bits, um, which, uh, which could be something very similar to the scaffold in terms of material science. So, perhaps a mycelium based microcarrier could exist. Um, actually, we were trying to do that to, to do some of that as well. Um, but at the same time, uh, that's not the scaffold, right? Like when we define a scaffold, it has to be a three dimensional kind of vascularized uh, vascular back, like the wrong word, I guess, but like a three dimensional product that looks like meat or a whole cut or a tissue, so to speak, I think tissue is the right word. So the whole tissue. Uh, whereas a microcarrier is just uh, that it's like a small vehicle for the cells to grow on as they bump around the the uh, bioreactor. Yeah. I so just carriers then scaffolds. That's that's the. Yeah, I completely agree. The the scaffold the the microcarrier should be earlier at the process for in the proliferation phase. I just mentioned that there is a section on the microcarriers and scaffolding. In a, in the in our uh, recent review paper. And well, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Shubankar. Uh, obviously, that is one last question from the audience. Uh, it's not a topic, but any information on spent media recycling. I know both of you are working towards end-to-end -end solutions. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can add to that that the uh, media recycling is extremely important. I would say more than uh, just recycling the media. Basically, if we can generate a sensor that uh, can uh, me uh, measure the core factors, that would be extremely important in order to recycle media. However, something that is uh, even more interesting, perhaps, than recycling media, is utilizing the media as uh, valorizing the media and trying to find other things that we can do with it. Because this is the first time that we get huge amount of uh, media that is produced, goes through uh, cell cultures, and uh, they generate lots of very valuable materials there that could perhaps use for cosmetics or for uh, maybe even for uh, regenerative medicine, some exosomes, some other growth factors, some other materials that are very valuable, I would say. So if we can try to analyze the media and find 
what is inside it and how we can utilize it for other purposes. We can perhaps subsidize the cultivated meat industry that way. I would mention that we have now a grant about this, uh, about trying to quantify the, the, the media and trying to analyze and trying to see what we can do with it. Because this, at least to me, seems like something that is very uh, profitable. Yeah, media recycling is necessary. Um, or you go and like find some other valuable thing to do with it, which is actually really interesting. Um, but without it, we well, I don't think no matter how cheap we get the growth factors, uh, unless you reuse the media, um, price parity is going to be so definitely a, a point worth discussing, worth looking into, um, and it's doable, right? People have been removing growth inhibiting metabolites with things like dialysis for ages now. Um, so look into that, uh, you know, read more about what, what they're doing and I think you'll find something very interesting. Um, how do you preserve your growth factors, your nutrition without, uh, while removing your growth inhibiting metabolites um, so that you can keep using the same media over again. Uh, thanks, both. We have two minutes to 7.30, and since we started the webinar slightly late, we could, slightly late, we could have a couple of minutes more. I have two questions. <laughs> yes, Shumaka? Sorry about starting late. I went to the wrong room. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It happens. It happens with us. Yeah, no worries. But I have two questions from my end, and one question which probably Tom can answer. Uh, so the first question is for Shubhanka. So, I mean, we spoke about uh, towards the science of uh, scaffolding today, but Generally, I think, Shubhanka, you have been in this journey of an, as an entrepreneur for quite some time now. Uh, so uh, just for the participants today, I think we have a very small cohort of 10 people, but most of them are really seriously looking into creating their, their own ventures in cultivated meat. So uh, what's advice you will give them all? For example, let's say from a perspective of uh, India, uh, where should, for example, where should they be able to locate the infrastructure, the strategy they should allow to find the right business and scientific advisors, uh, strategy to raise uh, the first round of funding for especially creating a POC or the first set of experiments which leads to a POC. Uh, anything, any insights would be nice. Yeah. Um, so what I've found that helped us and kind of get us to where we're at is, you know, start small, start create like, you know, what is it that you're trying to do differently? Spend some time on that. You know, cultivated meat in of itself is a very big problem. Uh, it's better if you find a niche that works well with your with your strengths. So if you are someone who is working with recombinant proteins all their life, there is lots of scope for you. If you're working with something um, else like media recycling or something like that, you know there is a lot of space for innovation and development. So spend some time on that. I would say um, before jumping into you know cultivated meat is exciting and everyone wants to make these products and have beautiful food to eat. I agree, but there's so much of the B2B side that is completely unexplored. Um, and, you know, if you spend time doing that, you're going to have a lot more valuable, a um, lot more valuable outputs and results. Yeah. And in terms of funding access, you know, BIRAC uh, has the grants and uh, all these schemes that they're running. You could take a look at that. And, uh, you know, all protein is an important uh, pillar to like any nation's development and so they're very supportive of that uh, in addition to that you know you have these uh, bio and bio nest incubators you could you could talk to the people nearest to you and i think uh, that could set you up for some successful pocs some successful experiments and then uh, take you to the next stage of like finding venture capital etc yeah thanks thanks Shubhanka, for that uh so obviously, we, as, as participants move to phase three, we have uh, definite presentations, webinars to help guide all the participants uh, as to how to look for funding, what kind of infrastructure they should be looking, what kind of buying incubators they should be approaching. Uh, but uh, let's go to the last uh, question here. That's that's by Yavidya. Uh, so I think Tom, we have been discussing uh, about this, right? For example, the opportunities for students who are looking to work in academia or industry uh, in the space of cellular agriculture. And uh, Yadudya, uh, he's a student, so he's looking for such opportunities in the future. But if you could talk to what Israel is offering and for the attendees, it would be nice. 
Yeah, so my uh, best recommendation is to email G5 India for, uh, for a meeting and to discuss your specific, uh, specific situation because uh, every person has uh, its own very specific situation. Is it undergrad, graduate, and so on? My recommendation is to study food science, uh, tissue engineering, and stem cells, um, uh, and trying to get into a lab like this to acquire the uh, appropriate, to the right um, skills. And uh, or animal science, meat science, that's something very valuable as well. And then uh, when you're an expert, you can uh, join the industry as well. Uh, basically, uh, try to get your foot in the door, try to get, no, do, doesn't matter what, just get into the lab and say, I want to volunteer here, I just want to work here. And that's how you get uh, the experience. And afterwards you can get to other places as well. But my, my recommendation is to try to get into uh, labs and to try to do some uh, research either in labs or try to get into a company or a lab and just work there. Just even if it's a cleaning dishes or whatever, work there and over time you'll get to a better situation. And then, uh, and then you will get into, some, uh, into a higher, because you, you grow in a lab, you, you grow after a while, you will start doing experiments, uh, but perhaps you will find a better uh, situation from the very beginning and be persistent. If someone tells you no, that doesn't mean that you cannot do your research. When I did my research, I went to my professor three times. First time I told her I want to work on cultivated meat, she said no. After a while I went to her again, I tell her, look, I have some ideas here. Maybe we can work on them. She said again, no, stop talking about this. Who cares about uh, this research? The third time I told her I'm going to quit the lab to go somewhere else to work on this. And she said, fine, you can work on this. So be persistent. Uh, uh, in Israel, we call it the Israeli chutzpah. Uh, you, you are just, you, you, you are determined and no one is going to tell you otherwise. And if you are determined, people will see this and say, wow, this is something valuable. And afterward, you will be able to do the research that you're interested in. But try to find people who are flexible that will be able that will allow you to grow, and uh, try to uh, find the best lab that you can, either in food science, uh, food analysis, either meat science, tissue engineering, stem cells, and try to get your, yourself in there. And over time, you will be able to grow. That's my recommendation. And again, contact GFI India. They are uh, remarkable, and they will be able to. Uh, help you uh, uh, specific, with your specific uh, needs. And if there is a need, you are also welcome to contact me as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yeah, I think these were the questions. Uh, I think uh, there were a lot of questions raised, so I didn't expect so many questions. But thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you, Shubankar, for taking the time out today and delivering a couple of Thanks. amazing webinars. I think it has been really, really helpful for the attendees. Uh, and thanks for everyone who could make time to join this webinar. Um, so this webinar as a recording will be shared with the attendees as well as um, the slide decks in, the, in a PDF format. Um, but uh, I think we can just end the webinar now. And Tom Shubhankar, have a good evening. And thank you all participants. Have a good evening as well. See you all Bye soon. everyone. Bye Shubhankar. Bye Akshay. Have a nice day. See Bye. Bye Akshay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.